Well, I uh, grew up in, uh, in Vermont and as a young boy found that I just loved the, uh, loved the outdoors, loved um, traveling around in the environment out in the woods and I felt a real connection to the uh, topography and to the earth and had questions from right from the start of why mountains had formed and rivers were where they were, etc. And as I got older and um, started to gain some education, I was drawn to geology um, as, a, as a field of study and that started to provide all the answers for me and, and just fell in love with the the study of the earth and, and um, how dynamic it is and how um, different processes uh, occur on the earth's surface on the crust and <clears throat> ended up working as a geologist for about um, a little over a decade and after and, and all along as I was um, also growing up I had a great interest in art and especially in landscape art given my interest in the in the land and such, and so as I um, as I was kind of learning about art, I, my, I was drawn to um, to looking at painting, landscape painting, and landscape photography, um, and so I started to take a lot of courses in photography at, in the evenings and such. And after, as I was saying, after about a decade of working full time as a geologist, I started to think. Um, that was this what I really wanted to be doing kind of at the end of my life I was looking at the time I was about 40 years old and I was thinking when I retire and I look back would I only have want, wanted to have been a geologist and I thought there was more that I'd like to express or or um, do and create creatively uh, through art so I applied to a uh, one year photography school in New York City at the International Center of Photography and um, sort of forgot about the application and three months later found that I was accepted. So I kind of took a big um, breath and decided why don't I try jumping off the, um, the track of geology and try something completely different. And I loved, um, I had a wonderful year in New York and the teachers really pushed me to take this knowledge I had of geology and of the earth and my passion and interest in landscape uh, art to, and see what I could do and play around. So I, um, in doing so, came up with this idea where I would um, create a, a landscape photographic image and, at an area that I was interested in where I knew what the underground underlying geology was and then with the onset of, of digital photography I found that in the computer with uh, Adobe Photoshop I could move layers around and it wasn't too difficult to lay photographs of, of geologic formations beneath the landscape view and so I sort of built this uh, composite image and found that uh, it, it actually worked quite well and so I, um, so after that school year, my uh, with support uh, sort of financially from my wife and her her profession, found that I could uh, pursue this sort of new career as an artist and tying in the geo geologic knowledge with my um, photographic skills. And so it's um, it's actually that's what I've done since that that time been creating these um, wonderful images of urban areas um, where I'll show cities and then I'll show the underlying geology <clears throat> sometimes to a depth of say 10, 10 to 15 to 20 feet other times I've gone as deep as four four and a half miles and um, and then I've also made images at locations similar to where I used to work as a geologist um, that were typically hazardous waste sites. So I'd show um, maybe where there'd been a spill and what that looked like underground and where the contaminants might be uh, moving um, beneath an old industrial site. So that's, um, that's pretty much how I got to be where I am now. And I've, four years ago, finished an image in the 
Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul, Twin Cities, metro area. Um, and that's, uh, I've actually, that was a great project. So um, that was kind of, that's kind of the, the lead up to that project, some, some, uh, some of the story behind that. geology text, I can well understand we would want to put a diagram in or a picture in that would give people a, you know, a sense of what's under them. But you must, you've got a different standard, I think, because you're also working as an artist. And when, you know, you, you mentioned at one point that you decided that this this project was working. <laughs> I'm curious how you, you know, how what what goes into deciding that it works artistically. Yeah, it's. Uh, I can... Well, when I when I went to photography school and researched a lot of the sort of the history of. Of landscape photography and I feel as though I, I have this um, foundation of, of imagery that, of, that I've researched and, and looked at over the years so I had a sense of, of that sort of as a as an education and then as I am photographing the land surface in different from d different vantage points and that's changed from both being on the land surface to also um, flying and photographing from an airplane, um, looking sort of as an oblique view of the earth. There, I, that's where I feel like my aesthetic, my aesthetic kind of choices are coming in, and there's a lot that goes into lighting and sort of the, what the sky may be, and then and where the sun is and. So, sort of thinking about these aesthetic choices in in comp in parallel with what I know to be underground and what would be the best vantage point to be looking at this earth structure below. Um, I guess I, I feel like all along the way I have a good eye for design and for composition. So, um, but I'm but all, there are a lot of layers running at the same time for me of, of considering the aesthetics of the image. And there's a lot of play and there's a lot of maybe moving forward with one idea and then it may not be working so well, so backing up and trying again. But then as I bring in the, the subsurface imagery, um, that, it just adds such a different component. And, and then where I'm deciding with my surface images to um, sort of in a sense draw a line, a, a cut line into the earth and then lay the layers in below. Um, it's, for me, it's almost like being back in the dark room of making photographs where I have an idea what it's gonna look like, but it almost starts to, it's, it's sort of an, something that we can't see, um, typically. We can't see what's in the earth below. But then as I create this image, what's sort of magical for me is suddenly these layers start to appear. Um, and this view that we are not able to see if, unless I were to do what I'm doing starts to appear and then um, and the colors of the rock I mean I'm tr being true to all the colors I'm not manipulating the imagery in any way um, and really it's uh, I don't know I think feel like I've been lucky there's some images that haven't been as successful maybe haven't you know I haven't fully brought them out into the world but for the most part I guess I feel like my sense of design is such that it, as I move along, it uh, it keeps it keeps sort of moving in the right direction, and I've been uh, fortunate to have images that, in the end, I feel like are quite successful as art. And having worked so intensively as a, as a scientist, as a geologist, when I went to school in photography, I I really felt as though I was making a decision to 
um, see if I was if what I was creating was legitimate as art, and I really kind of left science behind for quite a while, and really was intensively involved uh, in the art art part of what I was doing. And after about five to ten years, I started to feel as though I was gaining that 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 was my work was uh, turning out to be um, successful uh, imagery. So. Actually, now after about ten years of doing this, I've, I've circled back into the science world, and it's been kind of exciting to have scientists and geologists see my work, and um, and that's been an interesting uh, uh, sort of dialogue as well. Um, how do you get? How do you put together the subsurface imagery uh, for a particular spot? Well, I'll, what I'll do is when I pick a location, I'll end up, um, it'll take quite a bit of work. It'll be almost as if I were a geologist working on an investigation um, purely for the sense of understanding a location geologically. And so I'll look at the literature, I'll look at what reports have been um, created in the area I'm interested in in the past, um, and then I'll do a lot of reading and a lot of uh, research and slowly build up my understanding of the of the geologic history really of this of this site and of this location as far back as I can go and then as I start to see the well actually what what the biggest step then is is to create a geologic cross section which is the sort of black line um, framework drawing of where the different geologic layers are and how they're oriented and um, and then consider scale and how I'd like to represent those in the image uh, to make it reflect as, as best as it is it, as it can given the surface imagery that I'm showing and once I <clears throat> once I finalize that aspect of the image <coughs> excuse me um, then that's kind of like the, uh, the the foundation of the work I'll be doing b below ground, um, and basically I'll have a list of all these formations that are in my image. So with that, um, and with geologic maps and all the work I've done in the leading up to this point, I'll often be traveling um, by car and looking for all locations in the area where the different all these different rock types are exposed at the surface. Um, so I'll drive around and, um, and look for those and then often I'll use um, field trip guides. There are these wonderful series of books called The Roadside Geologist um, of different states and they'll actually have road law, you know, where you could be driving along a certain road and they'll say, well, you're going to pass these certain cliffs of rock and it'll explain um, the geology of those cliffs, but it also, for myself, in the work I'm doing, it'll kind of point me in the direction of where some of these rock cliffs are to photograph. Some of them are along rivers, where the rivers have eroded down through the earth. Others might be along a railroad where they've blasted through rock, or along a road where they've blasted through rock. So um, it varies where I'll go. And then I'll set up a tripod and photograph fairly um, the the technology I've been using is a special type of tripod head where the camera is mounted and um, I have overlapping images and it's set up in a certain way that when I then go back to the computer to s stitch the photographs together to make one composite image, um, it works really well. And um, But I'll go and photograph all these different rock types and they sort of in a sense become the palette of, for the image below ground. and. Um, and that's how I find the uh, the ge geologic portion of the image. So you get a general sense for a fairly large area of how long, a, how large a strip of various sorts of things there are under that area generally, and then you put that with the strip, so to speak, under this particular. That's right. Um, so what you're saying is the geology 
under this particular item, let's say the state capital, is whatever the average is for Ramsey County or something. Is that right? Yeah, it's, um, it's, geology is an interesting science because you have a few data points and you're interpolating a lot in between them. Um, yet, it's, it amazes me how detailed we can, how specific we can get as well, you know, sort of as an account, a counter to that. Um, for instance, here in the Twin Cities, once I had picked uh, this location that I'd like, that I'd like to make an image being from St. Paul to Minneapolis, um, I found that there's some wonderful data with a Minnesota Geological Survey available online where you can find a well you can find all these wells that are located along the, this transect or this line that I was interested in and I could um, actually pop up the, geolo the geologist or the driller's um, written geologic log as they drilled at that location at, at each of these specific locations into the earth and they would have measured at different points below the uh, surface when the different layers um, changed from one type of rock to another. So I could actually build, um, again, what they call this geologic cross-section or this um, graph paper, and I could line it all up, and I could then m draw lines between the different um, geologic borings across my image of, say, the contact at the bottom of the St. Peter sandstone. So it becomes fairly, you, one becomes fairly confident with where um, you know, where they're drawing a certain layer um, in the image, this particular image. There are other images where I may be out in a part of the earth where there's less data, the density of data is less, so then it is a little more averaged in a sense. And to speak actually to the sense of averaging, and one, um, one thing to consider is that I'm, if I, let's say I need to photograph a sandstone, one thing that's very important to me is that I'm not, um, I don't end up with, say, a library of sandstones from different parts of the country or the world. I'm actually looking for, if it's a St. Peter sandstone, I'm looking for that, that St. Peter sandstone exposure, and I'll go photograph that where I can find it. And it, that, in a sense, is averaging. It may be slightly, it looks slightly different beneath the capital, say, versus where I photographed it along the banks of the Mississippi. Um, so you have quite a lot of information about what is actually out there some places. I feel that, that I do and that uh, geology is pretty amazing as far as how much it's progressed as a science over the last few decades. I mean, it, it sounds like from the well drilling information you almost have what you'd have if you had a drill core. That's right. You know, I mean, you have written records from somebody who saw the equivalent of a drill core. Right. Uh, only they threw away the little chips and things. So that's right. When they were, when they were drilling. And, it, and there are often situations where they actually have pulled um, drill core, the cores of, of rock formation from the earth and they've photographed that and that's the pictures of that rock core is available in reports. and. They also, a lot of states will have repositories where they'll actually have boxes of these, these cores of rock that have been extracted from the earth where you can go and actually look at it. Um, some years ago I inherited a little bit of stock from Schlumberger and I gather what made their name was sending sound waves down and bouncing them off of things. And, getting a picture of what was underneath with an idea to oil exploration specifically. Is it strange to be doing, as it were, photographic images of invisible things? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot, you know, there's issues with the landscape of what you know, by what light do you photograph it? By high noon or but, but this is this is stuff that only the mole people see. In some sense, 
if we say about our image of it, Schlumberger's <laughs> chart <laughs> is going to be our, our image of what's below, that is. <laughs> for, in the sense, in any reasonable sense of what it means for us to see it, <laughs> these sound waves and, and things like that are mostly how we see what's under us. So, I mean, is there, is there a puzzle with that for a photographer? I mean, you, when, you, when you're on the top, there are all these questions about by what light, from what angle. <laughs> I mean, all these things that have to do with the fact that this is an actual visual experience for somebody. And then, when you go down, you're suddenly dealing with something that, in a certain way, isn't an actual vis possible visual experience. Right. Because people don't live underground, they do, and eyes don't work without light, and all that sort of thing. I mean, how do you think about that? I think I... I, I, I kind of step back. I have dyslexia, um, and when I was being tested for this when I was younger, the people that, that worked, worked with me and explained this, this, uh, this style of learning or understanding, they said I was very strong, a very strong visual learner. So, um, so for me, this has been a wonderful field um, because as, as, as learning geology, my mind is is so active as far as taking data, continually taking data and reworking my picture in my mind and my imagination of what things look like underground. And in the over decade of working as a geologist, I was constantly creating images and pictures in my mind of all these different locations all around, um, mostly in the Northeast and Northwest. And there were all these stories that I was finding that could be told. and. And then I was, in a sense, painting pictures as a, as a geologist, the way geologists do, by building, um, drawing cross sections, um, uh, and representing data on cross sections and such. And I and I remember feeling like, wow, it'd be wonderful if uh, if the the rest of the you know the, the general public could see what I was seeing. In a sense, I felt like. It almost like as if you, I were to be a writer writing books or a movie maker or something and filmmaker and um, they just seemed like really fascinating stories or fascinating images that I was imagining there to be below ground and so this I, I feel like this is what's happened for me is that um, visually I've found a way to um, represent what re we really can't see I mean and yeah, there's a lot of information. It's an amazing amount of information we've learned by, by measuring um, the magnetics of the crust or the gravity, gravitational forces in, in the crust and sending energy waves down into the crust and having um, receivers pick up uh, the energy waves bouncing back off of certain layers and as seismic studies and then sort of this very wavy graph looking like paper that's saying, oh, well, look at this layer, the top of this layer and that layer. And that's a very odd image to be looking at and trying to, in your mind, transfer to that to, well, what does the crust really look like? What does the earth look like a mile down? We're getting waves bouncing back off this one, this one surface. And, um, but I feel as though I gained so much confidence doing the work I was doing and drilling being out with drill rigs and seeing material coming up or looking at rock core that had come from a mile deep and like holding it and, and just that sense that that's part of the crust that I was holding, the, the weight of it. And um, so I, I guess I just over time I felt intimately connected to the earth in the crust and, um, and feel comfortable to be photographing wherever I can find these unit, these formations exposed um, where we can see them and light them properly. and take the exposures of them up, up here on the surface and say, well, okay, a viewer, I'm going to take this and lay this down a mile, you know, or six inches below, you know, the Twin Cities, and I'm going to show you that that's the uh, Jordan Sandstone, say. So it's, um, yeah, it is odd. I'm sort of showing what's, I'm showing the unseen. Um, and I guess I'm feeling as though I can, 
I'm, I'm lucky in a way I can do that just because I've, I've kind of taken two skills to be able to try to do that. You mentioned not just pictures, but stories. Yeah. And, and being fascinated with story, with stories that emerged as a, as a, as a, you know, as a geologist. Does that storytelling also come into your work now? Yeah, it's interesting. It's, um, I started showing my images when I was coming out of photography school and had very brief names such as um, Boston Basin and I'd show this little, you know, little bit of the Boston skyline and, and stretching um, to the south to Quincy and then up towards Stoneham, say a 16 mile width of the crust surface and then I'd show four miles below Boston in this geologic basin and um, or I'd show a gasoline station with a tank that leaked and the gasoline is uh, migrating away and I'll show these little white PVC groundwater monitoring wells and I'll show the concentrations of benzene and groundwater with a different colored kind of overlaid plume of these bright colors and I'd say gasoline station. And people would see these images early on and they'd say, wow, you know, and I'd like to, I like, sort of wanted people to see them and just work with them on, and just see what they felt and react and not provide too much information. And over time, people have often asked questions and asked what's the story behind certain images. And as I start to explain them, they're like, they, my, the response I, I've received often is, they wish that there was more involved in the title or there'd be a bigger explanation, a paragraph, say, next to the image. And that's the direction I've gone is um, emerging as an artist to provide more information. Um, and so the um, so now, yeah, I feel like there's a lot wrapped into my images that are these stories. Um, and I guess people, as far as how far they come in to get to know the images or the stories behind them, you know, gets certain depth of story with each image. Um, and I, I guess some of the stories that I feel like were interesting to me and when I was working as a geologist were, and I was young at the time and I loved nature and, and felt a real connection to the beauty and how we treat the earth. Some of the harsher stories to experience were um, one I remember was um, being up in Maine in this very beautiful rural area where an engineer uh, was retiring from Boston, wanted to buy land and, and retire up to this nice part of Maine. And he, he thought, as he was about to buy a piece of land, maybe I'll go test the groundwater um, coming from the faucet of a neighbor, um, just having some subtle concern for the quality of the subsurface. And, the results came back high in um, PCBs. So the state came in and tested nearby um, residential wells and found there was a lot of PCB contamination. They had them um, start drinking bottled water. And um, my one of my early jobs was to spend a summer drilling wells in this whole area. And it turned out that um, this person had a business of hauling waste, um, liquid waste, like oil, waste oil and such, and industrial waste. So this person, I think, was collecting waste from big chemical companies in the Northeast and had bought land throughout Maine and would come up to these locations at night with, and have made uh, some trenches with a backhoe and then open the spigot of their tanker truck and let the waste, um, you know, leak into the earth. So. I guess I was sort of shocked in ways at times um, at some of the, to me that was a pretty dramatic story um, and a sad story and uh, and there were, so and then I guess other stories I'm interested in say here in the Twin Cities is the story that I love mountains, I love topography, We, my wife and I moved here about eight years ago and um, we lived here for about four years and my response to the environment was this felt very flat to me, this upper Midwest region. And so as I started to learn about the geology of right here in the Twin Cities area, I discovered that there's this mid-continent rift that 
underlies the Twin Cities that stretches from Kansas all the way up through this area and into Lake Superior and sort of turns and goes down into Michigan. And that this, that over a billion, around a billion years ago, um, as plate tectonics occur where continents collide and come together and break apart, at one point the North American continent was, plate was breaking apart and it, it almost broke apart here, but then it broke apart somewhere else probably and this failed as a full um, separation and it was called a rift valley and then um, the, ultimately that valley was filled in with lots of sediments and um, then there was a long hiatus as far as the geologic history or the story of this area um, for about hundreds, <coughs> hundreds of millions of years it, to a point where then there was an inland sea um, that stretched up into the southeast Minnesota and, and through the area of the Twin Cities and this sea would sort of advance and retreat and there'd be deposits of sandstones or uh, sand or um, limestone alternating layers um, which is a pretty interesting period of time and you have fossils and such and then there's another long break in time and then more very recently we have the glaciers that came down and and, um, and some of the meltwater would would create uh, bedrock valleys that would cut deep into the bedrock and um, then maybe get filled in again with sediment as subsequent glaciers came through and they um, had a big impact on the land surface. So um, that's again another story that when you look at an image that I created of the, of the Minneapolis and St. Paul, um, it won't be expressed in the title, it'll be expressed in a little explanation next to my image, but that's, I guess that's my way of telling a story. Um, and I have a deep understanding that goes into the image. Um, and so I guess that's the thing I kind of wrestle with how much am I telling a story or how much, what more could I do um, to add more to what someone experiences when they view my images? Um, has this process of making images of this kind over and over again over a long period changed your understanding or your relationship to landscape. Hmm. Yeah, I think um, I think it, it, when I was a child, I loved being in <coughs> in landscapes, and I mean, I've always, all my life I have, no matter where I am, I'm constantly looking, looking, looking responding, ex feeling the experience of being in different landscapes. Um, working as a geologist, I almost feel like you know, it's sort of this fast-paced work where the world that I'm in and the mindset where it's about the projects and that I'm involved in and um, there's not a lot of time for reflection. I feel as though this last decade of my life has been really about having the time to, to sort of reflect and experience more of, uh, of, of different locations and, and go deeper into, um, into a place where I, pretty much everywhere I've lived, um, I've created these images. And, and that, I think there's a real sense of where, wherever I, I am spending a great period of time, I want, I kind of yearn for this deeper feeling of connection to that, to the location and the landscape that I'm in. Um, so that's what this artwork has done for me. Is it's um, it's allowed me time, and and um, which uh, I'm pretty fortunate to have, and uh, to be able to, to do all the work to 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 really understand this part of the earth, that particular part of the earth that I'm on at a given time. And it's interesting to there's a to me there's a bit of a difference between researching and understanding and picturing and building the picture in my mind. Um, of an area that I'm, where I'm, say I'm living at a certain time, versus what I'm interested in is that there's that type of understanding of landscape and where I am. But then to do now what I'm doing, which is to make these images of landscapes with underlying earth layers, 
in, in a sense, I feel like I'm splitting the earth apart and t peering in to take a look at what we typically can't see. And and holding and seeing those images, it's uh, it, it sort of it takes it to a much very different level. Um, I remember uh, you know, driving across the West, listening to John McPhee's yeah. uh, account of Wyoming, and as I was reading, driving, you know, I'm just struck that Wyoming is geologically something like the most interesting place I'd ever heard of. It's 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 so strange what's going on under that, underneath there, and, and uh, I mean, in terms of just action, there are lots of places that are peculiar in various ways, and other places that are less peculiar. <laughs> And I'm wondering if you feel at all the pull of the exotic. <laughs> you have the choice between Minneapolis and a particularly rich little three acres in Wyoming. Uh, if you haven't, you know, how you think about where to do this painstaking work. Yeah. Um, yeah, I. I I kind of feel as though it's uh, that would be the the one image I'd like to make, you know, towards the end of my career when I'm sort of like that would be a joy to to just say let this looks fascinatingly interesting, you know, it's very intricate and complicated, or um, and that would be a lot of fun to do. It's I guess what's been driving me is a lot that's been driving me is where I live. And these these places like living uh, in Boston, again that felt having grown up in Vermont with, in the Green Mountains, which is a moderate amount of topography. Um, Boston felt fairly flat. Um, this has felt flat living in up, you know this part of Minnesota. Um, it is odd and funny that I've ended up in these places where um, you know that I'm making these images, but. Um, but I, but what is surprising, what you do find, and that there is, there has been quite a bit of activity, and uh, you know it may look fairly flat at the time, but there's been some pretty amazing history in the past. When, for instance, in Boston, there was there was quite a volcanic period of time and some great mountains in that in that region. Um, yeah, I think a big response I had too is. Having worked in as a geologist full time on all these hazardous waste sites, that there were these these situations where the sort of the petrochemical industry the revolution. The, there's been a great cost of all the wonderful advances we've made and the comforts we we now live with, um, being that what it, what we've done to the earth and that having worked in that um, field. Pretty intensively, there was there was a response I was feeling that I really wanted to be able to show some of that, um, so that we have a greater sense of some of the environmental costs that um, that are down there. And my, one of my biggest passions is groundwater um, and groundwater flow, the science of that, and to see the impact we've had on groundwater, which is so so vulnerable that if you you know spill some gasoline into it, say from a leaking tank, um, the the, the impacted groundwater that could be, say, um, a source of our drinking water, um, that we've ended up sort of making this patch in the earth where if we drill down for that groundwater, that's probably, we, we can do a lot to, technologically to try to clean it up um, to save drinking water levels, but that it takes time, it's costly. Um, so one of the big areas that I'm really interested in uh, continuing um, I'm working on is trying to help show what groundwater is, um, where it is, how it sort of how it flows, and the fact that we're we're mining it in places where we're we're pumping it at a greater rate than it can recharge. Um, some of the issues around around groundwater, say in the Ogallala Aquifer, um, 
stretching from Kansas up through, I was from Texas up through uh, Nebraska or out in California where there's some real issues with water um, and our future water supply and irrigation is a big use, um, use, has a big use of groundwater. So that's an area that going forward that I really am interested in. And at the moment I'm also living in Pennsylvania where there's a lot of um, uh, frac fracking going on to um, pump shale gas um, from the earth and I've been pretty fascinated with in terms of being stewards of the earth and uh, again sort of like how we treat the earth that this um, how much we've been come, become dependent on fossil fuel use and um, that fascinates me and and then so lately being in an area where um, where we're pumping shale gas from the earth I and I'm fairly near that. It's it's become a new interest to look at creating a well, an image of a well, a shale gas well. Um, so how do we extract fossil fuels is interesting to me, and to try to do my best to show that all that to scale so that we have a better understanding of what we're doing in that regard. Um, so that's kind of in the near future where my interest is. And then, um, as I was saying with groundwater, that's really where I'd like to, s ex um, in the future, s sort of um, spend a lot of my focused energy to create more images in that area. Um, and then as far as like the, another little aside about Wyoming, what I find is that these are so labor intensive, these projects, they can take, some of them can take about a year to make an image, to do all the research, to find the rock to photograph, then to bring it into the computer and lay in all the layers and build it up as a composite. Just There's just a lot of hours and time spent. So what I'm finding is it's not easy to go travel. As much as I'd like all, anywhere around the world and say, oh, I'd like to make an image in Africa, say, um, I'd have to spend a long time there and, and or make a number of trips. So I'm finding it's just easier to really focus in near, within a number of hours of where I live and try to make the image locally. I ran into something some years ago, um, <coughs> Kushimu Blue. Um, there was a groundwater question when the reactor blew up. And so I was trying to get people locally to respond to the question, what would a comparable act, accident at Monticello do to groundwater in Minneapolis? As if it was as severe as Fukushima, is groundwater close enough? And is the groundwater connecting to the to Minneapolis water supply connected enough in such that that one would, would, would be looking at, for example, the, the evacuation of, of large cities? I didn't get very far on that, but it struck me, well, it strikes me right now that of the pictures one could make, the Monticello nuclear power plant probably has some priority. <laughs> you know, but wants to go four, mi four miles down under some place. <laughs> uh, and you're talking about a place that has on top of it sort of a device that's capable of forcing the evacuation of <laughs> several, you know, better than a million people. You know, there's a picture worth taking. Mm -hmm. And then again, you can go out to the country and find perfectly interesting ge geology uh, and maybe some issues, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have the social weight. And so I guess part of my, you know, since you're, you are concerned with these issues of pollution and groundwater contamination, and the effects of fracking and so forth, uh, how does this, and, and also because you, it takes so long to do one, how does this matter of social concern figure into what you commit to for projects? 
Yeah, that's been a, um, an interesting question throughout my life. Um, being When I was younger, I grew up in an area where there were a lot of people that cared deeply about the earth and we worked to preserve land in our town and went to college and um, you know there were environmental groups I get involved with a bit where it, at the time nuclear uh, power was there it was around the time that the Three Mile Island accident and um, there's a lot of concern and, and fear of the risks um, so I, I, I definitely got involved with nuclear power in that regard and um, and concerned about what are we going to do with all this waste and how long that you know that's going to be around um, that we're creating and how do we how do we take care of that um, and what was interesting is then I ended up working for my first job working for a geology firm they had really most of the work they had done to sort of get started they were working around different parts of the world helping the nuclear industry locate nuclear power plants in locations where there was not as much um, geologic um, activity like you know uh, earthquake potential etc um, and then I even was involved in a project where re um, let me think uh, where there was the repermitting of a nuclear power plant and they wanted to do something in a favorable way for this bay that it was located on to um, to help the environment there. So we were doing some groundwater studies there where they were gonna help create more estuary than there had been. Um, so I've had an interesting relationship with with energy and how it damaging it can be to the earth and um, concerned about that. Um, and sort of ethically some sort of battles that have gone on in my mind. So I think, um, and now with this project with hydraulic you know this fracturing for shale gas like deep deeply I feel strongly about not wanting to d continue doing things that I feel like can be harmful to the earth and and um, global climate change etc so it's it's a it's a battle for me really and I haven't fully uh, feel like I have an easy answer for myself to figure out what how I how I kind of move forward with my art but what I've been, the way I've been approaching this project um, in Pennsylvania has been where I can feel that in the environmental sense that, you know, I could make an image and that could be somehow helpful to environmental um, concerns or it could be an image helpful to um, the petroleum industry. I've been sort of feeling like where I keep falling ending and landing is with the data and with the science and with geology and so where I like to live with creating my art is is purely looking at all the data and and as best as I can the, the science in me I think is what steps forward and says let's create this image and make it as true to all the information we have to know what we now at the current time understand the geology to be below this um, well pad for where there's a a drill boring going down <clears throat> a mile the bit is turned and it's going a mile through shale and it's been fractured and it's pumping the shale gas back out <clears throat> so my approach has been to um, to just show to show what what we know of it and um, and then hopefully that could become part of helping everyone see and have a clearer picture of maybe of what we're doing and then add to the um, to our understanding and to our uh, our collective conversation and um, and decision making around these everything wrapped into all the layers around <laughs> what uh, what a shale gas well is all about. There are all sorts of levels of data. Right? In, in, you know, my eighth grade earth science book has a picture of Minnesota. <laughs> You know, four miles down, <laughs> that's little lines for things. And that's accurate at one level. <laughs> and it's not going to tell them very much about what's under Meeker County, let's say, in any very specific way. There must be places on Earth that are pretty close to perfectly mapped, or as close as we get. I mean, 
where you have drill cores close to each other going down right. serious distances. I don't know why one would do those, or but I, I expect that somewhere or other one could do a map that would be accurate. Would be accurate to, in in a way that nowhere else on Earth is accurate. And between my eighth grade earth science book as were the best map place on earth, there are all these other pictures where you may have taken six months or a year or, you know. Uh, and I guess part of the sort of thing you might know that nobody else I've talked to could know is when people industrially intervene deep underground or do something on the surface that could potentially affect deep levels, importantly deep levels, how good is the image they have of what they're doing? I mean, you've worked, you're now doing, you're now doing images without any particular kind of industrial <laughs> motivation. I mean, you're not, you're not <coughs> serving the, the mining companies or the environmental groups, but you have worked under the economic pressures of the industrial uh, sort of leadership. How, how, when, when, we, when we mess around with landscape in ways that that potentially affect the earth deep down. How much do we really know? That's a good question. Do you mean like how much do we affect the the earth deeper down in the crust or that might have an impact in the shallower part of the crust? Well, I mean, for instance, when they <coughs> built Fukushima, when they built Monticello, what level of information did they have? about what was under it. Yeah, yeah. Was it my eighth grade earth science book? Right. Uh, where is it? Is, it is, is Monticello close to one of the best mapped places on earth? Right. Or where is it? I mean, and you may not know much for Monticello, but you must know for some nuclear power plant how much you would trust the information you had as an industrial geologist. Yeah, um, I mean, it, I, the little bit of first-hand knowledge I can remember that a company I worked with starting out with, I think they were working in Brazil, helping with siting a nuclear power plant. And the geologists that I know involved in that were just brilliant, brilliant geologists, They're fantastic, just an amazing understanding of the Earth's crust. And so I'd, I'd sense it to be, you know, you're putting in all the intelligent capability you can to try to try to make this as safe as possible um, it is yeah and then I guess with Japan it's a pretty active area you, you know earthquake it's earthquake prone in that part of the the earth um, and you talk about financially and like how are they going to resolve their issues if they need power so it's interesting it's um, to think about yeah then the amount of risk you're taking you know, I guess probably a lot of it comes down to that. I mean, I would think that within the region of Japan that they were citing that nuclear power plant, they, they were thinking about nearby faults and, and where it could be most safely placed. And I guess the other thing too is that, you know, we're human and we do make mistakes and we put the best knowledge and thinking we can into it. And then we see nature, you know, has something that happens like a big earthquake, and we're like, oh well, maybe we uh, didn't didn't quite take everything into account at, as well as we could have, and things like that. So I mean, that's the that's the hard part. I feel like I've grown growing up and being young and idealistic. Some of the hard lessons I heard, I sort of witnessed of what we've done below ground with contaminants that have leaked, etc. Is um, it was a practice in the past that was not illegal to be piping waste, like say out of a pipe into a river, um, and that made a real mess. And then times have changed and we have regulations and um, happily, happily uh, 
we are very diligent about how we handle waste now. But that's that took a half a century, and what a mess we made for the even half century before that um, that I witnessed. It was really hard to see, um, and um, yeah, the. I don't I haven't lived here long enough to know where the, the nearby nuclear power plant is that you refer to. Um, the Twin City Basin that we are we're in a geologic basin here. So um, the the layers of rock, they're alternating sandstones and limestones. Is my understanding, and that the sandstones are more um, capable of serving as aquifers. Where if we pump from that sandstone, it's going to provide a lot of water. And because it's, it's shaped almost like a very subtle bowl or saucer, it's a basin, um, the, the limestone and sandstone layers, say, may uh, be um, exposed near the surface out on the perimeter, on the edge of this, of this basin. And that's where rainfall and precipitation in terms of the water cycle falling on the earth, that rain can portion of it can work its way down percolating through the soil and into that sandstone layer and then if we're pumping it say here in the middle of the basin that groundwater is um, is flowing um, towards this well that we're pumping and the travel times vary um, over quite a scale you know you may be pump a house may be pumping from that sandstone near that recharge area to that um, that aquifer out near the perimeter, and maybe that water's been in the ground for, um, you know, traveled for the order of, um, I don't know, tens of, of years, versus maybe here, some of the water may have, may be traveling over tens to hundreds of years, or even some of the deeper groundwater that flows could be thousands of years old. Um, so it's, there are a lot of factors to consider there, and um, what I've been interested with groundwater is how important it is to land use planning that we want to be um, hopefully and I think the in this country they've done a good job about um, the source area for getting a sense of mapping where the source areas are to, to wells that we pump for our municipal water supply and then mapping them and then um, in the future hopefully that um, land use um, there might be some regulations about you know not placing a nuclear power plant or a um, some industry that uses a lot of chemicals right on that source area because if that has an accident then you may you've maybe compromise this just amazingly prolific wonderful fresh clean drinking water supply um, and those are the kind of decisions that I've been really interested in um, kind of related a bit to some of your questions so this base I mean the base you want to paint is you don't stick a nuclear power plant inside the basin. Yeah, it, depending on what you're looking at it, like if I'm looking at groundwater and, yeah, and the ground, and I think a lot of this, I should be careful because I, I don't know a lot about this, but I think a lot of the water supply for for this, you know, the Twin Cities area is from river, the river, the Mississippi River. So I think that happens in a lot of big. Um, big urban areas when you have a big river flowing by that becomes the source of water to drink um, and the groundwater is still pumped for a lot of reasons not to say um, you know that it's not and I and I don't know if, if the nuclear power plant is in the basin so I, right. you know, I, I don't know where it's right. located but but just just as a final question I mean from your experience in nuclear, as somebody who fussed around with the geology of siting nuclear power plants, would the geo would the geological survey of an area that was done prior to building always be good enough to find that base <laughs> if it was there? Yeah, something is is uh, prominent as a basin. I feel like yeah, you, you know, you're gonna that has been discovered fairly early on. So they're, That's they're, they're always going to know feature. that level. That I would level think so, yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, it's, yeah, geology, my understanding is geology started around in the early, mid-1700s, and um, 
it's, I'm amazed when I look back, I'm fascinated by history, so I'm, I'm even interested in the history of geology as a science, and I'm pretty impressed by some of the, the understanding that was gained in, towards the, this area was started to be studied very intensively in the mid-1800s, um, and then, you know, through the late 1800s and early 1900s, some of the, I've seen some really interesting reports where they're starting to really put the picture together. Of the of how the you know the geology the structure of the geology what it, how it looked, and it's it's sped along at quite a rate. It's pretty impressive um, how how much we've learned and the general general pictures have been well developed of the structure of the crust and and now we're even looking deeper um, and deeper into the crust and and then like you talk about like between the eighth grade textbook versus this very highly intensely known location like the U.S. Geological Survey has taken locations um, and I'm not sure if they probably they've purchased the land because they've said okay we want to study this and they, it's they call it like Swiss cheese they have drilled lots and lots of wells and they they use them as study cases for situations where we as society we need to know more about a certain aspect to do with geology or groundwater so they, they will commit a lot of intensity to learning about particular things that we they feel we really need to know going forward. Thank you for your time. Oh, you're welcome.